Hello, BookTube. I've got a little mail for you today on a beautiful blue sky, open window day. Very, very pleasant afternoon. So I think this these next couple of days, uh, maybe in the next week, are going to be the kind of weather where it's beautiful during the height of the afternoon, but it's chilly at night and chilly in the mornings. Uh, but there is hot weather coming. If I'm any judge of the data that I'm looking at, and I'm not, <laughs> if I'm any judge of that data, a week from now it's going to be actually warm. Not not just, you know, pleasantly spring-like, but actually warm. We shall see. It's been a wonderful day for uh, for just the beauty of the outdoors. Uh, and there's a little mail here, and it's of varying types. There's one periodical. There's some books, but two of the books were opened off camera. I know that's, that's a no-no, but I did it anyway. Uh, but we should go over them because, oh boy, are they both Steve books. But first, the periodical. The periodical is the new issue of The New Yorker with this great, great cover. Just look at that. That is awesome. Uh, and there are two things of note uh, in this issue of The New Yorker. One, uh, we'll start with the, there's one that's pleasant and there's one that's unpleasant, but we'll start with the pleasant one uh, because the, the uh, pleasant one is a bit of a throwback for The New Yorker. Uh, let me see, I should have turned down the page, but ah, here we go. Uh, this is a, a cartoon. See uh, an older man, he's startled, he's at his laptop, he has his butler right next to him, he has a monocle. <laughs> and the uh, the caption is, Why, Jameson, does this mean that Musk character will own all of my quips and retorts? <laughs> and not only did that make me smile a little, but it also, uh, it also brought me back, uh, because... The New Yorker just doesn't do that anymore. The, the, that, the, that figure right there, some of you will know I have a, a long-standing fascination with New Yorker cartoons. I know them book and chapter. And that figure, that sort of setting of the clueless, monocle-wearing, hyper-wealthy, you know, think, think the, uh, the, the dowager from Downton Abbey asking, what is a weekend? That kind of thing. The New Yorker used to mine that vein of of humor endlessly the kind of gilded age plutocrat who's completely divorced from reality i don't know why they don't do more of it we have an enormously more of that kind of plutocrat and also obviously a gigantic a gigantically bigger wealth gap now than we had when the new yorker was founded so 100 years ago so i don't i don't know why they don't do more of it it's it's fairly uh it's fairly rich if you do it right. Uh, but the other notable thing about this issue is something that I'm not going to show you. I'm just going to tell you about it. There is a photo spread in the middle here of pictures from Ukraine. And they're like nothing I've ever seen in The New Yorker. There must have been an editorial decision at some point somewhere where a whole bunch of people around a table or maybe in a Zoom meeting got together to discuss whether or not to run these photos at all. They're incredibly graphic. They're incredibly disturbing. And, you know, the New Yorker doesn't shy away from graphic or disturbing subject matter, but they usually don't show it to you. I bet there was an editorial meeting at some, at some point along the line with half the people there saying, no, we can't do this. And the other half saying, we have to do this. We have to uh, make this real to our readers as if it isn't real to them. But I want it, in case you're getting this on the newsstand, I don't know why you would since every issue of the New Yorker is $10. Uh, but if you do, you might want to prepare yourself. Those pictures are not easy to look at. Uh, but those were, that was the periodical, and then we have the books, and uh, the two books that are opened, I had to show to you. I have a feeling that a, that a few of you are going to want to put them on, you know, pre-order lists, uh, for their very separate but both very Steve-like subject matters. <laughs> the first one is by George Wagle, and it is The Sanctity of the World, a new book about Vatican II. <laughs> uh, this, this author, some of you might know his name, he had a biography of John Paul II that did really well did unexpectedly well. It was, I think, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and this is about Second Vatican Council. And uh, this is an advanced copy, so it doesn't have an index. So I don't know uh, how prominent my Pope is. <laughs> I, know, I know some of you whippersnappers think you have quite the Pope in Pope Francis. And I admit, he is quite the Pope. And some of you slightly older whippersnappers might think, well, He's quite the Pope, but the superstar Pope was John Paul II. Uh, and then it'll be the handful of people out there who aren't whippersnappers at all who remember, oh, oh, in the 20th century, did we have a Pope? Pope John XXIII was the Pope who, against, surprised the entire world by convening Vatican II. He was not 
the sort of thing anyone predicted he would do. And he did a lot of other things besides. Boy, oh boy. There are a couple of, uh, in the middle 20th century, especially uh, uh, at or at, uh, slightly after his death, uh, there were a couple of really good biographies of John the Twenty Third, and uh, I don't have either one of them, uh, and I, I wish I did. Uh, but a new book on Vatican II, <laughs> absolutely. This the the uh, the uh, subtitle is the vital legacy of Vatican II, which just makes me want this thing to be three times as long. I want as much of it as you can give me. <laughs> so that's that was Steve book number one. Actually, this comes with a sheet, right? So I'm just talking to you about it. I should tell you about it. Uh, like we had opened it. Like we had opened the package. This is coming out in October. So this is a long way away. I think that's the furthest date out for any book that I have. Uh, let's see here. Vatican II was the most important event in Catholic history since the 16th century Council of Trent reckoned with the Protestant reformations that had shattered Christendom because of the pig, Martin Luther. Uh, called by Pope John XXIII, yay! <laughs> And to address the, civiliza the civilizational crisis that had led to two world wars, the Council was intended to launch a new era of Christ-centered and evangelical Catholic vitality in the modern world. But today, 60 years after its opening on October 11, 1962, Vatican II's meaning remains sharply contested, and in some respects, its promise remains unfulfilled. Uh, so that that is this. That was the thing I didn't know from just telling you about the book. This comes out in mid-October. That's a long, long way away. I'm going to be very tempted to read this before then. So one of the things, you know, I don't tend to read so far out, uh, but this really tempts me. This is a Steve book. Uh, and this next one is also a Steve book. But whereas a new book on Vatican II would have been a Steve book for a very long time, uh, this new one is a Steve book very recently, <laughs> and largely thanks to you. This new book is called Like, Comment, Subscribe. <laughs> It is a history of YouTube. <laughs> it's by Mark Bergen. The subtitle is Inside YouTube's Chaotic Rise to World Domination. <laughs> so let's hear about this, shall we? Like, comment, and subscribe uh, comes out in early September. Uh, the first book to explain exactly how YouTube's technology and business evolved, how it works, and how it helped Google throw, grow to unparalleled heights of power. The author, a Bloomberg reporter, takes you from YouTube's humble beginnings as a scrappy startup to its billion-dollar acquisition by Google through the company's ongoing struggles to tame a creation that's spun out of control. Uh, the author is one of few journalists whose reporting is exclusively dedicated to Google. He has broken numerous stories about the company, its business, and its scandals. He spoke to hundreds of current and former Google employees and YouTube experts and creators. His unprecedented access makes like, comment, subscribe a thrilling and enlightening story. Thrilling, maybe. Enlightening? <laughs> I wouldn't count on it. Uh, let's see here. There, the the, uh, the cell sheet here gives me helpful bullet points in case I don't know how to think on my own. That's uh, YouTube's unreported history of editorial curation, which they scuttled in favor of growth and algorithms. The algorithm and how the company's constant alterations to it led to an uneasy relationship with creators. Its partnership with controversial figures like, can you guess? PewDiePie. <laughs> yes, indeed, I'm sure. This thing has no index yet. It's an advanced copy. So I don't know uh, what other creators are mentioned in here. Uh, the proliferation of conspiracy theories, disinformation, and violent content on the site, and YouTube's often feeble attempts to combat it. That I have never understood. Why people say that their attempts to combat it are feeble, I do not know. And let's be honest what we're talking about here. Censorship is what we're talking about here. Like, for instance, let's pick an extremely unsavory example, just so that we know where we stand. An extremely unsavory example. Once upon a time, years ago on YouTube, there was a long, it was like two hours long, uh, Holocaust debunking video by I don't I don't think any of you will know what I'm talking about but it was a guy who spoke in a dreadful monotone he was never on camera instead he was walking readers through the notes and citations for five or six really prominent works of history about the Holocaust dissecting their sources and what they they take from each other but also the guy went a lot further than that he did what 
Holocaust debunkers tend to do, which is ask, is it possible? Was the crime possible to do at all? And he went to the, he went to the extent of going to the butcher and buying a six-foot uh, dressed hog and trying to burn it to see how long it would take. And he just kept going. He was burning on the beach. He keeps getting, in between his discussions of original and secondary sources, he's taking you back to see the progress of this burning piece of meat. And it was disturbing, and the comments were off the charts. The comments would have made Reddit blush. Uh, th those parts of it were, and his obvious anti-Semitic agenda was, they were revolting. Some of the the line by line excavation of the original source material that he was doing, he was showing you what he was doing. He, he's never on camera. He was showing you what texts were cited and exactly what those citations said when he hunted them down and read them. And that might be loathsome, but there's no way that you can call someone doing just that someone engaging in disinformation. It was the conclusions he drew from it that were horrific and bigoted and included disinformation, but I don't know about feeble attempts, because vi that video and videos like it, there were thousands of those about 9-11, they're all gone. They're not buried in the algorithm. They're gone. They might still be on YouTube, but you would have to type into the search bar exactly what they're called in order to find them. And uh, I don't know. Am I the only one who doesn't like that? I don't like that, that Google would do that. Because, well, because 9-11 and the Holocaust, those are extreme examples. But if Google can do that, then they are making a call on all examples. How do I know what they'll consider extreme and what they won't? I'd ra I guess what I'm saying is I'd rather have that unsavory content up there than have it censored by people just because it's their platform. I, but anyway, <laughs> that, that's a digression because I don't. I hear that all the time. I don't believe that Google's attempts to combat disinformation, in other words, to censor its own platform, are feeble. I don't think they are at all. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we have more points here. Uh, the influence of Google on YouTube's operations, namely the blind faith in technology for fixing problems. I myself have implicitly blind faith in technology to fix my problems. Uh, the surprising ties to kids and parenting content and how YouTube's foray into children's programming frequently landed in hot water. Yes, I saw some of those programs that I think are now demonetized or gone. And they were a completely different thing because they weren't just putting out misinformation into the world. You, you know, you're an adult, so you, you pay attention and you weigh one thing against another. They were directly trying to manipulate children. I was up in Vermont at the old house in Vermont uh, with the Richardson family years and years ago. When I, because they had little kids at the time, I was exposed to those channels for the first time ever. And the creators of the, on those channels would just come right out and say... Kids, make sure to tell your parents that you like this item or that item. Make sure to ask them for it. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, to children. That, that, anyway. Uh, and the final, the final point, in case I can't think of myself, is the corporate power struggles with Google and Alphabet and Susan Wojcicki's eventual ascension to CEO of YouTube. Uh, and this comes out, uh, did I mention already what date in, in June? Uh, or September 6th. This comes out September 6th. And uh, it has it's an advanced copy, so it has no index. So I don't know how many creators are going to be in here. I'd like to sort of try and guess who will be in here. I mean, PewDiePie, I doubt that, that the author would interview PewDiePie for this or would get an interview even if he asked for one. But who else? Who else can we guess would be in here? Marcus Brownlee for technology reviews? Maybe Philip DeFranco? who's had his share of run-ins with YouTube and made his share of compromises to them. Uh, is Mark Bergen going to look at the just statistics of YouTube? Who's been around the longest? Who's made the largest number of videos? <laughs> In other words, am I within my bounds to wonder if I am mentioned in this book? I have no idea. I'm not going to read it until September, uh, but I can't even guess because I don't have the finished copy. Uh, and then we have, so those were, that was Vatican II and U2. So we, if we deal with these as books today, then we're on a massive Steve roll. Those are two huge Steve books. We do have a package. It's thin. Uh, but is there any chance that it will be a third Steve book? 
Shall we use? Shall we open it and see? Any chance? I don't think so. But let's let's give it a look and see. Uh, oh well, almost, <laughs> almost. It's popular natural history, which is that's almost that that almost counts. Uh, what have we got here? Good lord! Look at all this stuff. Okay, I don't need to know what. Oh my god! Uh, I don't need to know any of this stuff. Let's let's get to. Did you give me anything about the book itself? Okay, this this is out already. Uh, this is just this is just hip deep and blurred. Uh, this is by Stefano Mancuso, uh, and it is translated by Gregory Conti, and it is the incredible journey of plants. Uh, <laughs> the author in his photo poses with plants. <laughs> uh, he's one of the world's leading authorities. Uh, on the, in the field of plant neurobiology, uh, which explores signaling and communication at all levels of biological organization. He is a professor at the University of Florence and has published more than 250 scientific papers. Uh, okay, so the incredible journey of plants. What have we got here? Most of us know little about plants, and it turns out that the little we do know is often wrong. <laughs> uh, this new book, Out Soon in Paperback. Oh, this did come out already? Yes? This is the paperback original. I think this came out last year. That would account for all the blurbs. So we're getting the paperback. Uh, we probably saw the hardcover on this channel. I'm just blanking on it. Uh, this author shares fascinating stories from throughout history, from the polar ice caps to the middle of the desert, desolate islands and ground zero Hiroshima, all places where plants have thrived. Uh, and, <laughs> okay, this sheet also has a bulleted list of points that I might want to use if I can't think for myself. Let's see what those points are. How humans save the, avo the avocado from going extinct. I remember, we did see this on this channel. Uh, how the zone of alienation around the site of Chernobyl disaster has become one of the most biologically diverse territories in the former Soviet Union. Uh, why the invasive species of today are the native plants of tomorrow. The story of August Engelhardt, who started a cult whose followers could only eat coconuts. <laughs> he died of malnutrition in 1919. <laughs> uh, the magic of seeds, tiny capsules capable of protecting a living embryo in water, under ice, or in a hot desert, without air, nutrients, or shelter for years. The sad tale of the beloved dodo bird. <laughs> what on earth is that doing there? <laughs> What on earth? Why is the dodo? I don't know that I ever read this when it was in hardcover. Why would the dodo be in here? There was no element. Plants weren't involved. Humans killed the dodo. Uh, well, anyway, I, I don't remember this. Maybe I'll get ten pages in and remember it, but I don't remember it now. Uh, old Chik Tijiko, which is which at about seven to ten thousand years old, is the oldest tree in the world. Okay. All oh, right, the oldest tree in terms of a single individual organism with growth rings. But not the oldest living organism, nor the oldest living plant. There are clonal colonies where groups of plants essentially clone themselves and just keep going forever. And there, the, the record is much higher than 10,000 years. Uh, although, uh, this plant, the, the name of it is T-J-I-K-K-O, the name of this 10,000-year-old plant. And it often comes up in on YouTube when uh, YouTube atheists debunk young earth creationists. It's not a hard thing to do, but they often bring this up because this this single tree is older than young earth creationists think the universe is. Uh, and then the final bulleted point here is the Mammillaria hernandezi, which has the capacity to conserve its seeds and release them into the environment only when conditions are better for germination. I think I read this. I think I did. I'll have to check and see uh, my reading journal. Uh, but I think I read this, and I think the takeaway that I took from it is something that's only barely hinted at uh, in the author's bio, but gets a lot more room in the book. If I'm remembering, if it's the book that I remember it correctly, uh, this book goes to alarming lengths uh, to demonstrate that plants are aware of their surroundings, that they're aware of each other, and that they can feel, and maybe even in a rudimentary way think. 
uh, which sort of screws vegans over royally, if that's true, because what are you supposed to do? <laughs> if that's true, what are you supposed to do? Uh, what are you supposed to eat if plants don't want to be eaten? <laughs> if they don't, if they actually have a preference in the matter, which, if I remember correctly, this author pretty conclusively demonstrates that they do have a preference in the matter. They might, it might not be thought, but that they don't like being ripped out of the ground <laughs> and chopped up and sautéed, that they're capable of like and dislike. Oh my God. <laughs> well, you already know what happens to vegans, if that's true, right? I, I can't be the first person to bring this idea to your attention. If it turns out, if in the next five or six, ten years, science indisputably proves that plants are feeling semi-sentient beings, they have a form of consciousness and collective you know, awareness, and that therefore it's unethical to eat them then we all have only one choice, and that is to live exclusively on Mega Stuff Oreos, <laughs> which have no organic material in them at all. <laughs> well, the the, uh, the comeback that I've heard from uh, dedicated vegetarians, maybe not vegans, uh, on in that scenario is that if it were to be conclusively proven that literally everything in Earth's biome has an ability to form preferences, which is what veganism is based on. Veganism is based on the fact that, that things with the ability to form preferences would prefer not to be tortured and killed for meat. Hence, they go for their protein and everything else, their fiber and their carbs and whatnot, to things that, as far as we know, are not able to form preferences. If it turns out that they are, I've heard from many, many vegetarians, not any vegans, but many, many vegetarians saying, well, if that turns out to be true, then I'll just, I'll go back to being an omnivore, I'll put meat back on my diet and just try my best to ethically source these things. You know, it is possible to eat ethically sourced meat. It's more expensive, and it's more of a pain in the neck. And you have to verify it. it, it ha you have to go with places that allow visual inspections, regular, unscheduled visual inspections, so that you know that the animals are having a life before they die. That That is a kind of an ethical wobble room for some people I know who really, really like meat, is that, you know, at, at least it's not... Right now, the meat that you're eating gets to your plate through torture. There's no other way. And it's also pumped full of chemicals that don't have to be cleared by the FDA because they're not technically being used on you. <laughs> Instead, they're being used on animals who can't move at all and are urinating on themselves all day long. So you have to pump them full of chemicals or they'll just die. Those chemicals have very murky origins, and they're in you. If you eat that meat, you're eating those chemicals. Uh, there are ways to get around that. There are, there are ways to sort of ethically source your meat so that there's none of that going into the animal. The animal has play, companionship, sunlight, the earth under their feet uh, until they are harvested from meat. <laughs> That's, I've heard from many vegetarians who said, if it turns out that plants don't like being eaten, I will just ethically source all my food and I won't worry about it anymore. I won't worry so much about it anymore. I don't know. What about you? A lot of you are avid gardeners, yes? Probably an avid amateur gardener is yards ahead on this subject than specialists. Do plants know that you're around? Do they know that each other are around? I'd be curious to know what you think on the subject. But anyway, though, that's that's those are our books <laughs> for the, the mail hall. We have the Incredible Journey of Plants. The more I think about this, the more I think we not only saw this on this channel, but I did read it. Uh, then we have Like, Comment, Subscribe about YouTube, the platform that gave rise to my world-straddling stardom. Am I going to be mentioned in this book? Hmm? Am I the only YouTuber whose cover blurb on a book has been featured in an HBO TV series? Hmm? Starring that delightfully Diminutive Penn Badgley? I may be. <laughs> Calm yourself. I will still allow you to address me by name. <laughs> this directly involves us all. You watch a lot of YouTube. I watch a ton of YouTube. 500 new hours of content every minute. <laughs> it's, it's just staggering. Uh, and who knows how many of those I account for. <laughs> and finally, The Sanctity of the World. A new book on Vatican II. Way too short for my liking, but I'll take it. Absolutely, I'll take it. Uh, some of you might be able to uh, remind me of the details. There was a really good book on Vatican II about, I want to say, at the end of the 20th century that was three times this long. Am I remembering that right? I could swear I remember reading such a thing and really liking it. 
I'll have to keep an eye out for it. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's the mail, and there's the bean. Hi, baby. You looking at your fans? Huh? How are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that'll do for now. I will be back. Thank you, Booktube.